everyone. Welcome to this video about five ways to quickly level up your Kate security posture. I'm making this today because there was an OpenSSL bug announced this week. It was a critical, but it went down to a high, but it got me thinking that generally speaking, a lot of people do the bare minimum or kind of panic when it comes to how do you secure Kubernetes. That could be everyone from developers to SREs to even assist admins who run perhaps the nodes as well. I want to show you the five things that I will always do on any cluster I run. They're super simple, some are practice and some are process. But if you do these, you can rest a little bit easier that you've hardened your cluster a bit more and reduced your attack surface. I really hope you like it. And please do like and subscribe and let me know what you think at the end of the video. Thanks. Okay, so step one is role aggregation. Often when we create a cluster, we just go and say, hey, here's our cluster admin, keep config, go ahead and use it. You know, that's fine if it's a demo cluster, if you're just doing it as a POC, but as soon as you start to involve other folks, even when you start to involve applications and workloads that become a bit more critical, it's really important to think about moving beyond that fairly rudimentary and frank, frankly dangerous approach. So what I want to show you here is something called role aggregation. On the right of my screen, you can see that I've got a cluster role for SRE. So let's try and represent that. Imagine I'm a, a megacorp here and I have an SRE cluster role. Now, my SREs are able to either directly access this cluster through Jumpbox or some other means. However, they can get onto this cluster. So what does this actually mean? Well, by using cluster role aggregation, what you can do is this rule set here will be filled in by the aggregates of the other cluster roles. So for example, when you see I've got that SRE monitoring cluster role, which is down here, that will roll up into this cluster role up here. That instantly gives us some benefits. We have separate life cycles for these cluster roles, right? This cluster role can be managed and extended to cater for new monitoring tools that might need to be monitored or to have SREs interact with it. Equally, I can also add a set of additional roles. This is super powerful because you're really following the least access uh, and the least privilege rule. So if I have something along here like, you know, debugging, I can make sure that that debugging set is really small. It also enables me to have a subset uh, of these cluster roles for developers and not have to have custom and unique uh, cluster roles all over the place. So for example, here, the developers can also take the SRE debugging um, cluster role, but they probably don't need the monitoring cluster role. So I would really advise checking that out. Even if you build one or two simple sets of cluster role aggregates, it will really help you when you have multiple users on your cluster. The next thing I wanna show you is Kubernetes API auditing. This allows you to effectively output to the log any sort of information that's useful around events, changes, policies, and objects inside of your cluster. It's incredibly powerful when you compound it with logging that can alert on certain events. So on the left of my screen here, you'll see that this is just a link to the documentation around uh, the auditing API and how you can configure it. What's more interesting is on the right here, so I have an audit policy, right? This audit policy describes what I care about. So I have a log level set to none uh, when I have certain requests like config maps, etc. This is uh, an example taken more or less out of the documentation. I've only modified it very slightly. But what you can see is that we have certain things that are being um, put into the logs here, for example, secrets. Now the question mark here is, well, what do I do with this? Well, to enable auditing, it's pretty straightforward depending on your flavor of Kubernetes. So I'm not gonna give you an example for every type of Kubernetes, but if you're using something like Kind locally, well, this is pretty straightforward. So what I would do is I've created a, um, uh, in my temp directory, I've created a, an API folder. So what I'm gonna do is drop that audit policy in my slash temp slash API. What I then do is I want to create a Kind configuration file. So this kind config, as you might have seen if you use kind, just describes how to start up kubeadm. You could do this with any other kubeadm-based Kubernetes. The real thing that it's doing here is passing flags into that server. But you can see I have what's called the audit log path. So this audit is actually mounted from this container path that comes from the host path of temp API. So we just double check that. So I go to temp API and I go to audit policy. I can see that I've got my audit policy here. So what you do is you go ahead and you create your cluster with your kind YAML. And once your cluster is running, you will see that you get inside of temp API, a new file called audit.log. This audit log is now putting everything outside 
of the cluster into this folder regarding audit information. Already, you've got a wealth of data. For example, you can see the request responses. You can see whether um, a, an RBAC request here has been allowed. I'm just reviewing this. Okay, so Cube Controller Manager. And this is super, super useful when you're trying to determine who's doing what in your cluster. And actually, there's some great projects that I'll put some links to in the documentation of this video that can actually set up um, really good Loki-based uh, rules on this. And of course, your logging scraper could also be something else like um, you know, Splunk or whatever. But the important part here is that we're able to pick out certain events and really look at the, the, the response codes, right? So we're getting 400s. We can actually pick out uh, that log response and do something interesting with it. I really think that turning auditing on is a super useful activity when you have more than one useful again, a user again, because then you can start to look at particular events and you can build up a sort of a forensic view of when things go wrong. And also it can show you whether or not you're you know, sticking to your GitOps approach or sticking to your hands-off approach in the cluster because it will show you when clients actually make requests against the API server. When it comes to starting to think about the state of your cluster and the security that's actively in practice, I like to think about how do we do this in a dynamic way? How do we continuously scan our cluster? So on the left of my screen, I've got the vulnerability report that comes out of the open source tool Trivi What's exciting about this is that Trivia will scan your workloads and it will give you a score. So you can see you have this critical high, medium, low, and unknown on the right. And already I can see that I have several criticals inside of this particular image version of Cert Manager Controller. Also down Loki as well have these CVEs inside of them. When you actually go into it, you can find a bunch more detail. You can even look up in the security database uh, what the particular origin of this was. On my right side of my screen, I've got a slightly more visual representation of some of the issues in the cluster with from Cubescape. Cubescape also has an in-cluster component. I'm showing this one because not everybody wants to do continuous in-cluster scanning. They may not have access to those reports. They may not be able to get them out of their cluster, or it just might be the case that their workflow dictates that they would prefer to have something in a CI CD pipeline. Cubescape, you can also do that there. But either way, both of these tools are now starting to level me up and thinking, oh, wow, there are actually things that I've got to care about in my cluster. There are things that are coming out as advisories. I should try and look at upgrading that image. For example, with this image that I showed you a moment ago of Loki, maybe I want to look and see, is there a new version of the image in the Helm chart? So I'm being put in the driver's seat and I am taking the responsibility for the security posture in my cluster, especially around the workloads that I am deploying. If you've been following the deprecation of pod security policy, you'll know that there's been a big gap in terms of functionality that's been crucial for helping cluster administrators and security folks keep clusters safe. However, that's just not gone away without anything to replace it. Pod security admission controller has just gone into GA in 125. What's exciting about this is that it puts a lot of the definitions in pod security policy into the API. Therefore, Privilege, baseline, and restricted are three different standards that effectively give you a set of controls that can be tested against. So you could have a pod uh, in a namespace that has a certain requirement, and when that pod is then injected into that namespace, the admission controller will test against, those, against that requirement. So there's things like you know host network, privilege containers, et cetera, et cetera, based on your uh, risk appetite. So for example, on the right of my screen here, I'm going to do a quick check to see you know what uh, in all of my namespaces would not be in compliance with the restricted level. So you can see there's quite a few different uh, pods and various workloads that would violate the pod security enforcement level. So for example, here, you can see that the Loki distributor has a set comp profile that allows for privilege escalation. Uh, and there's a few others as well. Now, just to show you how this is so easy to run, we can also then do a, a baseline check. I'll see fewer results. I think things like uh, my local storage, yeah, and my ingress may also violate that. You can see here that the ingress is using host port. So this is fantastic because it means that you are gonna be able to run this on any cluster and get the same result. It's not down to interpretation of pod security policy. It's not something that is gonna be installed later on. This is out of the box in Kubernetes. If you want to see more about how do you actually enforce this well, you would, you would label uh, the namespace that you want to have a policy against. Equally, you can also create a cluster-wide set of uh, policies and the way that those are then escalated. 
you can see here that we've got, we should be doing warnings on restricted and also put them into the order API, but we should be enforcing against baseline. We could change the enforce against restricted as well, depending on what we want to do. And of course here, we can put our exemptions in. So this is a really fantastic way to make your cluster that much more secure. The final suggestion I have today for improving your security posture is to use an identity and access management tool. I'm using Keycloak in my clusters because it's open source. I use it with the uh, OIDC Connect provider DEX because as well, that's a great open source project that can be deployed into your cluster. What this effectively enables you to do is to have things such as single sign-on by contacting an upstream IDP. It's really great for folks who might be using something such as G Suite and you see that Google Auth pop up or something like GitHub and you can provide your GitHub credentials. I would recommend this because most of the time when people need to interact with a Kubernetes cluster, they do not need to be doing a port forward, right? Most folks will need to be using things like the Argo CD UI and this stuff will already primarily be served uh, through an endpoint. If we think about that Argo CD example, you know, let's say I'm a developer and something's not working. Argo's great in that it already comes with an HTTPS um, web available endpoint for the web, but sometimes that's not enough. In fact, sometimes there might be a generic password on that, and we may want to have a way of actually providing something a little bit more secure for our organization. This is where that login is effectively intercepted. You would have an endpoint that is accessible by Keycloak. It would be a realm, that would be your authentication realm. And then what would happen is the individual applications would go through this login flow. What I really like about this is that it allows you to build your Kubernetes in a far more professional way. So I use the simplest incarnation of this. I have a single realm and I sign in with my Google account. And this is great because anything that I have on the web, I can create a simple templated custom resource or a piece of configuration that extends Keycloak um, for that application. I mentioned Argo, Prometheus endpoints as well are a typical one, even Grafana. It's great for the applications that do have UIs, but many of them won't. You'll even have potentially an open API application that developers might be working with. If that is unauthenticated on the web, even if it's HTTPS, you're still exposing yourself to DDoS. I hope you've enjoyed this quick roundup of different ways that you can really elevate your game in terms of security posture. We started with aggregated cluster roles. So give people just the access they need and give them the right access. We then moved on to looking at auditing, see what they're doing when they're in the cluster, make sure that we don't have any anomalies there. Then we talked about scanning continuously, both in cluster, out of cluster, for misconfiguration, for container images, and for runtime vulnerabilities. Then we spoke about pod security admission, the super powerful new tool to actually analyze some of the stuff that's built into Kubernetes. And finally, we talked about identity and access management, using tooling to start to make our journey into Kubernetes and people that work with it that much more secure. I hope you've enjoyed this. By no means was this exhaustive. You'll find tons more information on the web, but for, the, for me, this is really the stuff I do every single time. Please let me know how you get on and do like and subscribe. Thanks again. Bye.